Welcome to another episode of Coder Conversations. This is Kevin. Hey, how, how's it going, TC? And uh, we have our special guest today, Jonathan Jennings. How, how are you doing today, Jonathan? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How, how are you two? Pretty good. Oh, man, I can't complain. Mm -hmm. That's good. So, yeah, man, um, you, you've been developing games for a while now. How, how long have you been in the industry? Yeah, I've been in the industry for about um, it's, it's 10 going on 11 years in April. Um, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's a really long time, man. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, uh, what, what made you want to become a game developer? Man, I um, Man, that's a good question. I think I didn't really I didn't know you could like get paid to make games for most of my life. And then I think I uh, was about to graduate high school and I saw this uh, ad pop up on the TV for DeVry and they were talking about uh, game programming curriculum. And um, the moment I saw a commercial, I was like, Mama, I want to go see what that's about. And she was into it. And so we went. We took a tour of the campus. Um, I fell in love as soon as I saw the computer lab. And then, uh, yeah, that was that's kind of it. But yeah, um, I've just I've always loved games. Like I grew up in love with them. I was one of those teenagers on the forums all the time. I would walk up the street to go to Ralph's to get the newest like Xbox magazine or um you know anything with a demo disc because that was kind of my my go-to and so um yeah i've just always loved games and so when it came to the opportunity came time to decide what i wanted to do making games um uh, and like learning that i could make them that it just felt right so what was your experience like at devry and uh like what what language did they teach you like c plus plus assembly yeah right it is um it was it was kind of an interesting time because i i started going there i graduated high school in 2008 so um, i started there in 2009 and that's kind of if you think about games it's kind of a a weird spot right because that's like the 360 generation right ps3 so it's a lot of like console games indie games were just kind of starting to come onto the scene um flash games were on their way out and so uh, and then mobile games just still weren't coming yet. And so uh, what I, I learned was Unreal because I was kind of, they wanted to teach you how to develop console games primarily. Um, they had a, uh, um, a most, for the most part, all the game engines were made in C++ at that time. So C++ was kind of the core language. Um, I did learn a little Shockwave Flash, but again, like Flash was on its way out. So um, didn't, uh, like, I guess action script is probably a better way to describe that. But yeah, I learned a little bit of that. Um, I learned some like Lua scripting, which Lua is like a scripting language they use a lot to kind of like do uh, mods and kind of tools in game development. And um, um, those were the main things. Yeah. And then the game engine wise, yeah, Unreal, um, the Unreal development kit, I guess you'd say Unreal 3 um, at the time, um, uh, Tort 2D. Um, I, I think I don't even think Unity was taken seriously at the time. So those are kind of the main ones. Yeah. So like once you graduated, was it easy to find a job or was it pretty challenging? It was super hard. Yeah, I think uh, I think I graduated. Uh, well, I I started sending out like, you know, resumes for internships and in, around my junior year of college. And um, I think I would, like I, I mentor people and I always tell them I, I sent I sent 300 resumes between that junior year and me getting my first gig in like the industry, um, just nonstop to every studio I can see. A the coast um got lots of no answers um sometimes i get the Ill, e the inbox bouncing back at me because they hadn't checked the inboxes in a while um i got a few interview requests um i think i had i bombed 10 interviews before i finally like got to like interview 11 which was the studio um, i finally got hired at and i was stuttering through the whole thing um uh, i was just excited to even be in a place where they made games um uh, and yeah, but yeah, it, 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 it was a struggle. It was a struggle. It was a struggle for me to kind of learn how to program too. So, um, yeah. Oh yeah, man. That seems like the typical experience of the industry. Like me and Terrence mm -hmm. both had to submit countless apps, face rejection and all of that. Right. How, how, how did yeah. you keep your head up and not give up and face all of that rejection? Yeah. Right. Well, I think I was obsessed if I'm honest. And I think my, my kind of, a. Uh, my interest and passion for games is I, I feel like it borders on obsession sometimes. Like it feels like um, kind of like an internal drive. Like I just want to make stuff. And I think once I learned how to make stuff, I was kind of compelled to make stuff. And so um, 
just you know believing that i i knew that if i found the right place and i always kind of felt like if somebody gave me the opportunity to make stuff for him i'd do a good job and um sure enough the opportunity came and i, I did what i could and here i am 11 years later yeah, we we hear uh you know a lot of horror stories about the game industry like a lot of crunch and all of that is, is that true or in your experience <laughs> Right. I think as I've gotten older, it's gotten a little bit better. I think it definitely towards the end of those, like when I graduated, it was, I remember like our professors specifically having conversations with us that you will crunch. This is the expectation. If you don't want to crunch, then you're not, you shouldn't work in games, right? Like this is, this is the life you're signing up for. Um, and my first game studio, we, I think my first week, I was at the studio 13 hours a day each day for like, I wow. think it was like a six day a week, right? It was pretty intense. And then uh, um, definitely like that first job, it was like nine months. That first job was insane. I was nine months. I think we created five games in nine months, which was, we didn't have a huge team. So that was a lot. Um, slept at the studio a few times. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was it was intense. Um, again, my obsession I think got me through it, but it, it was very much real. Um, but I think as I got older, it got easier. Uh, yeah, the hours got yeah, the hours got more realistic and whatnot. Uh, what oh, okay, <laughs> sorry guys, I got disconnected, but uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, last year telling us uh, you was working the 13 hour days. Yeah, I was working 13 hour days. And then, um, yeah, you know, I had lots of like late nights. There was nights where we'd sleep at the studio as a team, like, um, like you know, a full 20 or four hour shift. That That's crazy mm. to think that we did that. Um, did, I think we did it at least twice. Um, um, you know, lots of six day weeks, um, definitely came in on a few holidays. It was definitely tough. And I think it, earlier in my career is more common. I think also, I think two things happened. I think as I got older, I kind of got fed up with it. But I think that was part of it. And I think also as I got older, I kind of started to, and I and I started to look for jobs that, that was less likely. And then um, also, I think just generally studio culture is like, you know, people became more outspoken, like we don't want to work our whole life away, right, at, at, on a game, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I, I think just the culture of games, has, it, and I think it's gotten better. Um, I think it still happens plenty in the industry, I think, but I think people are a lot more vocal about sharing, like, this is what's happening, and, you know, the news, if they find out, they are going to blast you front page, and the whole gaming world's going to talk about you. So I think we're, uh, people are a lot more uh, outspoken about it. So um, it's gotten better. Did you ever thought like uh, thought about pivoting to like another industry within software because those those demands did sound crazy? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the work I do now, I think I would say for about five years straight, I just worked on games exclusively. Um, I, and then I kind of started to pivot towards VR, and VR kind of pivoted me pivoted me towards more like games adjacent technology so like i i do stuff like create augmented reality um and virtual reality um experiences centered around like cars and stuff um i've worked at like i've worked to make like uh enterprise focus like app building tools um and then right now i technically work at animation studio we use games technology to kind of power our animation and so like i I will say, like, I don't think anything's harder than working on a game. I still think that's the hardest work I've done. I, I've worked on a lot of hard things, but the pace of game development is is a whole different beast. And so I definitely tend to lean more towards, like, game-adjacent projects now where I can, like, apply my game development skills but don't have to be in a studio, a, a game studio, um, just because um, just the pace of game development is it's impossible to compare to any other software I've worked on. Do you, um, like, as a game developer, right, you mm -hmm. said that you're, mm -hmm. you're doing, like, game-adjacent projects now. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see yourself going back to game dev? Like, if, I, it, if it, like, um, even if it's, like, maybe double-A or, like, indie titles versus, mm -hmm. like, a triple-A um, studio? 
Right. Yeah. It did. I think it. It's more to me. It's more of a question of like culture fit, right? Because I think the studios. I would. I almost was going to go back to a game studio. Um, in this last job search, I was going to potentially go to Shell Games. They just came out with Among Us VR, and that was, was what I was going to work on. Um, and so. Uh, they like their pitch was very much that they were not a crunching studio. They had a really healthy yeah. work life balance. Um, and so that was really appealing. And like studios like that speak to me. Like I, I, like I love working on games. Like it, 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 it satisfies my soul in a really deep and real way. Um, yeah. And so if I could, if I could work in like a sustainable and cool environment, I would love to work on games again. But, uh, but I think until that becomes like a, a reality that I could like bet on, I, I'm more than happy to work on the stuff that I work on now. Yeah. Cool. Uh, do you find it, I know at least for myself and I think Kevin as well, well, maybe not uh, Kevin, but for myself, a lot of jobs are mostly remote now. Yeah. And I know, uh, it. how does that, how does working remote how has that affected your uh, dev, dev process? Is it just they just send you all the equipment, like the like an Oculus Rift or something mm-hmm. else, or how, how does that work? Yeah, right. Yeah, so definitely, I'm uh, the current studio I work at. Um, it's called Mind Show, um, and so they they sent me like a, a Oculus Quest two. Um, they sent me a computer to work with. Um, um, I'm trying to think that they send me anything else. I guess they sent me like a long ethernet cable just to like, you know, connect to my router just cause we download really large assets and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they basically sent me like a whole work from home setup and this is the first job that's done that for me, which I, I thought that was dope. Um, other jobs I kind of like, they hoped I had a computer already, which was fine cause I did have a decent computer, but, um, it's a lot nicer to have like a dedicated work computer to work from. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, and then I am curious, like, how did you, I guess, in when I was growing up, right, they say like programming had a lot of math in it, game dev has a lot of math in it, stuff like that. Is that true? Like, if I wanted to get, if I wanted to step into the ring of game programming, would I have to know like a, a certain threshold of math or? And I get away with not not knowing any math. Like right. How, how useful is it in your in your day to day life? That's a great question, and and I think it scared me a lot because I was terrible at math growing up. Like I was, I was happy to pass both of my most of my high school math classes with a C. Like I I, I would be so happy, um, and so. Um, that was a, a huge intimidating factor about like joining games, um, and so. I think to like you can absolutely make a game as long as you understand basic math, right? Because you know certain things like incrementing a score counter, um, you know, knowing how high up a y-axis a character should jump, you know, being able to apply an x value for how fast a character should run, right? Like that type of stuff is um, it's really straightforward, and I don't think it's complicated math. I think for the most part, if you at least know basic algebra, I think you can get away with most simple games. I think the complex math comes from like, when you start to get really deep into more complicated um, game mechanics. And mm-hmm. probably one of the more complicated things I implemented is I, I work on an indie game called Galactic Bar Fight, and um, there's a sword in it. And so with the sword, I have to measure the player's velocity when they're swinging like either a sword or a hammer. And then usually there's a value applied to that, that I have to like that. I apply to like the enemies they're hitting. So if mm-hmm. it's a hammer, then the enemy flies further, right. Based on how fast you swing the, the hammer. And then with the sword, like they slice based on like you hitting a minimum swing threshold. And so like calculations like that, that's when the math starts to get a little bit more ca- complicated, like more physics based math. And then um, even more complicated stuff than that is like, you know, calculus and stuff. But that's when you're really trying to make, I feel like if you're trying to make a really unique experience, that's where those kind of math expressions come out. But um, but as long as you know about algebra, I think you're good to make, like you can at least make a, a platform or something. Cool, cool. Mm-hmm. Um, dang, I, I had a question about, um, it just, it just let me, Give me, give me a second. I'm trying to think of it real quick. <laughs> no. Um, yes. So, like, man, what, what were some of your uh, game inspirations? Like, what did you really like playing uh, as you were growing up? 
Oh man, I was I'm a sucker for platformers still to this day, right? I grew up on Mario and Sonic. Um, the very first game I made was inspired by Mario and Sonic. It was a platformer um, um, called The Amazing Sketchbook. And like um, my fr- a friend of mine in high school, he would like we'd be in history class, and he would never take notes ever, 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 ever. And so he every time after class, he would show me this notebook of all these crazy doodles he drew and whatever. And I would just laugh like you'd never take notes. And I think when I got to college, I was trying to think of what the first game I wanted to make was. And I thought back to his notebook and I was like, it'd be really dope to have like a character in this crazy notebook that's just running and trying to get through the page. Um, And so that that game was inspired by Sonic and Mario. Um, And so, yeah, platformers are uh, they speak to me. Um, definitely a big first person shooter fan. Halo. Um, it's probably one of my favorite games ever. Um, love RPGs, the Final Fantasies, Mass Effect. Um, I play everything. I was just playing NBA 2K, lost to the Warriors by one. I was upset, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so but I play I play everything, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, I, I remember my question. So uh, you're you're a gamer, right? Mm-hmm. And as a developer, mm-hmm. do you ever have you ever experienced something where like you play you're playing a game and you're thinking to yourself like man this is this is programmed so poorly or why <laughs> they do something why they do something this way yeah yeah i do and it's yeah i do and it's hard cuz i think there's two sides of it like i think one side of it is games are so complicated that like sometimes there it like there are parts that don't work well and there are other parts that work really well and usually that means there was a time trade off somewhere or somebody decided to prioritize resources in one area or the other, you know, a game might run really poorly. It might be gorgeous, but like the frame rates trash. And that means at some point they had, they got the art team together. They got the programming team together. And they're like, we'd prefer this to be prettier than for it to run well. Um, or maybe the programming team just didn't have enough time to optimize and make things run as well as they could. Um, but like game, like making a game is such a trade off of like, you know, making it pretty, making it run well, making sure it's stable. Um, and so, yeah, I've definitely played games where I'm just like, what were you doing here? Right? Like this was, <laughs> this was a mistake. Uh, and then I played other games like, you know, I'm playing through the first God of War so I can get ready for the second one. And I'm just, it, you know, games like that just strike me as like how... Like somebody had to sit down and envision this and then they communicate to hundreds of people. I need you to do this. I need you to do this and bring this huge vision together. Um, And those are super inspiring to me. So yeah, I I, I do both, I guess. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I know the um, gaming industry can be kind of toxic. Well, especially like the game, the gaming community, like Mm -hmm. forums and message board. Mm-hmm. They trash the games, you know. They mm-hmm. think all the game developers are lazy. Yes. Uh, and like, how, how do you deal with that criticism, or you just completely ignore it? I try to ignore it. I think I'm. It's probably a good thing I'm off Twitter because I think I was bad, bad, bad at ignoring it on Twitter, especially right. Like, you know, somebody's going after your friends, and you hear the stories about how many late nights they spent to make a make a game and then you know they get attacked for a part of the game they didn't even work on right like artists getting attacked for um the online not working or that type of stuff like there's it, it, that stuff um frustrates me but but i think honestly you know any kind of creative um art or interactive medium work like you're going to have people who love what you do and you're going to have people who absolutely hate what you do. Right. And I've worked on games that I've gotten glowing reviews, right. The type of stuff I screenshot. It's like, you know what, this makes me feel good. Next time I have a bad day, I'm going to look at this comment. It's going to really speak to me. And then other times you read things and it's like, wow, why did I even bother? And uh, I think you, I think when you make anything kind of creative like that, that people are are supposed to have an opinion on, I think you just have to be ready for the good and the bad, right? Like people are going to love you. They're going to hate you. Um, You just kind of got to do your thing and do the best you can. And hopefully you can live with however people feel about it. Who who are some of the uh, game developers or, you know, game designers that really inspire you? Like Hideo Kojima, Miyamoto. Oh, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hideo Kojima, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, um, uh, Lauren Lanning. I don't know if you guys played the Odd World games way back in the day, but those were some of my favorites. Um, um, 
uh, uh, Peter Molyneux, he made uh, Fable, which was one probably the game that inspired me to like start to think like a game designer. Um, uh, how am I forgetting his name? Um, oh man, uh, Tim Schafer from Double Fine. Um, he made like Psychonauts, right? Um, um, uh, uh, Genova Chin, who made a uh, journey and like, he's from that, that game company. So, uh, 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 I think it's journey flower, um, flow. Um, yeah, there's lots of, lots of designers that, um, inspire me. Um, and one, one, probably more recent one that I really enjoyed meeting was Andrew Augustine. Um, he, he's makes super Ubi Island and he's an indie game developer. And so, yeah, um, yeah, I, um, yeah, so many, so many. And then, you know, I've met some over the years. I've met people who like, um, one of my, uh, one of my favorites, um, oh man, how am I going to, uh, oh man, I miss, his name is slipping my mind and I do not want to, um, I don't want to, oh Tony Barnes. There you go, Tony Barnes. He, I met him um, at a game developer conference a few years ago, and he, uh, I grew up, you know, on Sega, and he worked on a game called Jungle Strike, which is this old helicopter game. And um, you know, he like when I met him, it was the year he was winning this award, and it was so amazing to me to see like this black man who was winning this black and gaming award for his contributions to games that I played growing up, and I didn't even know he was behind these games, right? And I, I hope that people like Tony um, and, you know, the many black game developers who are kind of unsung heroes get to get their spot in the sun. Um, so, so many, yeah. Gotcha. We have a, a question from the audience. Uh, okay. Ismail Barba, what do you think about the whole NFT aspect of NFT games, like games from Gala Games? I am not a fan of NFTs in games and not, not necessarily. I don't, I think there is, I think the promise of NFTs or really the promise of crypto is actually really interesting. Like if it was able to be accomplished, right? The, the idea that you could have a, a essentially a, a database or a repository a, like that's completely separate from English, any single entity that you could like take, you know, Ubisoft tokens or take Rockstar tokens to different games that you could, you know, earn um, tokens in Assassin's Creed and spend them in Red Dead Redemption. I love the idea of that, right? I think that'd be really dope if like I had a persistent like currency or something that I could carry and earn from games and take from game to game. I think what I, I think the current, iteration of nfts and games bothers me and and kind of the play to earn model is i feel it it turns games into a bank and i that bothers me in certain ways right i because for me games have always been kind of an escape and so i i always think about i you know i just lost the warriors by one in nba 2k right and i'm bitter about it but i'm trying to think if like i earned like real money like let's say I played 10 games a day and I earned $2 for each game and I lost this and I lost my $2. And let's say I was relying on that $2, right? Like, I feel like that turns, you changes your whole relationship with um, kind of the game itself. And, and it turns into like a casino essentially, right? With a more elaborate casino. You don't even like, at least, you know, at the normal casinos, you just pull a lever and whatever you get is what you get. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm not a big fan of NFT games. I think that there is a value of crypto in the gaming space, but I'm, I'm not really a fan of what NFT, what NFT games are right now. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Terrence, uh, we talk about it all the time. We feel like a lot of modern gaming is pretty much teaching kids how to gamble, you know? <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, you look at the um these gotcha games right like especially yeah. mobile games where yeah. uh you don't necessarily have i mean if you play it on the free model right you're it's up right. to whatever algorithm they they divide in order to give you you know enough just to keep coming back 
Um, but then once you start to once you start to I guess add money into the mix, right? The game knows, mm -hmm. hey, this person's willing to spend. Mm -hmm. Let me give them, you know, uh, let me increase the chance of getting this JPEG or this character by thirty some odd percent. Or I'm just throwing right. out, you know, ideas, but. Right. In my mind, that's essentially how it works, right? You give yeah. it money and the algorithm knows, hey, if they yeah. spent money, then do this. Uh, right. And, and then you're basically teaching these young kids, like, oh, if you spend money on, on this thing, it'll give you what you want. Right. But, like, I always uh, talk, talk to Kevin and it's like, you blow on, like, back in the day, Chrono, Chrono Trigger was on a SNES <laughs> cartridge and you take it out and you blow it and right. you put it back in the console and you press... <laughs> You, you you press start and then right. it, it, it loads up and then right. <laughs> any other version of it that might have to have a bug fix or whatever would have to come back on a different cartridge or right. or whatever right you know like they back in the day they used to update you know mortal kombat and street fighter and and right. whatever other games just to fix bugs and stuff like that but back in the day like those games came as is they didn't they didn't right. have all this dlc and stuff like that so um my question for you is uh when you're developing a game do you, mm -hmm. do you ever does the ever does the topic of dlc ever come up where you sort of have a a roadmap of what you want to you want to develop as your base and then you say all right this is our base and then mm -hmm. the rest is just dlc like do you do you go in with with dlc in mind and sort of start axing stuff Right. Right. That's a really good question, right? And and I think it depends on the game, right? I think, you know, live service games are super popular, right? And so those are absolutely made with like their like there's an expectation like this is what we're going to we're going to make it up to this point and then after this we're going to release gradual patches and milestones yeah. and we're going to release this content over time. Um and I've worked on a few games with DLC and, you know, I've, I've worked on games with DLC where it's like, we didn't know we were going to have DLC until the game shipped. And it's like, oh, okay. So now what do we do? Right. Like, cause we spent so much time just trying to get the game out the door and then it's like, oh, okay. So now what's next. Right. Um, and, um, and so, and I think it's, it's a fair question. I think, I think the only, I think, one thing that does frustrate me is I think game developers catch a lot of heat for those decisions. And I think people would be shocked to know how much your designer and programmer don't have a say in whether or not you kind of get screwed with DLC and stuff. Like it's our bosses who are like, oh yeah, we want to make as much money as possible. We're going to release this character that everybody loves. We're going to release this really dope costume set. We're going to release that after. We're going to charge them 99 cents per costume costume and um you know i've i've worked with game designers who are like i absolutely hate like coming up with the game economy stuff um and um but that's their job right and so yeah it i i totally get where the frustration comes from and i um i and i i i as a gamer i get upset with it too it's a bummer when like you get the game and people you know who are um ripping like who ripped the game like can see dlc key is already in the files right like oh wow they just withheld this and who knows how how many months before the game might have been finished or gone gold and um so i i totally get the frustration yeah okay. so ismail had a couple of more questions he said how do you feel about the metaverse do you think the gaming industry will eventually be like player ready one and he also said mm -hmm. You think VR and AR games will become the trend? Man, I love I love VR. I think uh, about five years of my work in kind of like game the game adjacent stuff has been all VR pretty much, and so um, so I'm a big fan of VR. Um, I released uh, my first indie game, Galactic Bar Fight, on the Oculus Quest. So um, I'm a early believer and adopter. Um, I think. I think VR is definitely the future. I feel like, and people say this all the time, right? We're in the Atari phase, but I, I think that's I think that's true. Um, I also think we're in a really, I have really strong feelings about Meta because I feel like they, in a lot of ways, kind of set VR as an industry back by talking about the metaverse as as it currently is thought about. Um, um, 
And and I definitely think eventually we will have like a Ready Player One esque type, um, like almost. You know, when I, people talk about the metaverse, I think the best kind of comparison I've heard is like a digital, uh, almost like a virtual internet that we'd all be inside. Um, and so I definitely think that could be possible at some point, but I think that's so many years away, right? And and I think the frustrating thing about meta, Meta's metaverse announcement to me was it's almost like they gloss over everything VR is today to like sell this promise of what VR could be in 10 years. And it makes people, when they play VR stuff now, they're like, this is neat, but it's not Ready Player One. And it, it's a bummer to be in that space, right? Um, right? It's like, we're really doing cool stuff. The technology's still advancing, things are evolving, but it, it's not the dream that was sold. Um, yeah. Do you see uh, VR as the end game or is there something beyond VR that uh, we can head to? I mean, you know, my science fiction brain says eventually like neural implants and stuff, right? Like matrix <laughs> jacking in type. <laughs> I got that. But um uh but I think I to me VR, I, I really love how physically connected VR experiences are to you. I think that's kind of my favorite part about it is um, you know, how much I think VR VR that's done right can be very open open to the player's interpretation. Like one of my favorite games um, in VR is Gorn, and it's like an arena combat game. And um, essentially you have these weapons with weird physics. You swing them at enemies and stuff. But my one of my favorite videos is like there's this MMA guy who like basically went did a no weapons run in Gorn and so he just went and fist fought all the enemies and he like he was destroying them and uh it was just really fun to see this guy like use his actual body and actual technique from his personal life and then incorporate that into the gameplay and to let the game's physics kind of resolve that and like let him win just by being him right I think I think there's something really cool about that and I think eventually if we ever get to the point of like actually having vr sports and stuff it'd be really interesting to kind of see what it looks like to have a virtual space where um or people don't have to be in the same room to compete like that so anyway yeah i think vr is super exciting um i think it's in a, a kind of a, a rough place right now and I'm, but i'm hoping the psvr2 kind of renews people's interest in Sure. Um, yeah, Ismail had another question, uh, but yeah, thanks for joining us, Brian. Um, Ismail asked, uh, how do you feel about Cyberpunk 2077, how it had all the bugs when initially released? <laughs> how does the game get released as a ready-to-play game when it obviously isn't? You see a lot of that in the industry. Oh, man, you're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> um, um, oh, boy. Well, okay, so we'll start with my gamer hat and we'll work backwards, right? My gamer hat says there's no way Cyberpunk should have been launched the way it was, right? Like that's, I think that's clear as day. I, I, I bought it early. It was not the game I was expecting. Um, it crashed a lot. And like, I, I actually had a pretty good experience with it and I was still disappointed because they just, they, the promo videos were really misleading. Like they, it was like, it was a very clearly, uh the demos were presented in a very deceptive way right and so um so my gamer hat says like there's no way that cyberpunk or any game that's kind of released in that big broken state should release like that um and my game developer hat says i'm sure all the people who are involved in it were really, really disappointed i think one of the things that kind of came out after the game came out was like they threw qa under the bus which that sent my Twitter circle uh, into an uproar because there's no way QA didn't tell the higher ups a billion times, hey, things are broken. And they are just like, well, but we have a release date. And so they shipped it anyway, right? Um, and so the game developers weren't happy about it at all either. I promise you that. Um, I think realistically, the, the hard thing to kind of communicate to people sometimes is the money that happens behind games and how expensive everything is. And I think they probably legally had to release it, even if they shouldn't have released it. And um, 
it's it's disappointing because I think I think Cyberpunk has a lot of really great qualities that got undermined by the fact that it probably should have been released a year and a half, maybe two years later. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, we got a couple of other questions from the audience. Uh, I am Lou. Is it hard for a self-taught game developer to get into the industry? And Ismail also asks, how big of a learning curve is it to develop in a new Unreal Engine? Wow. Um, yeah, I think so. I've worked with some really awesome self-taught games devs who um, who did get in the industry. I don't. I think it's hard to get in the industry period, right? And I think um, even for the really talented people, there is an element of luck, right? You kind of have to meet the right person at the right time. Um, the like, you know, one of the guys, the probably my favorite person to work, who's like self-taught. He worked at the bar underneath where our game studio was, and um, he talked to the the founder of the studio, and that's what got him the job, right? And he uh, and so. So, yes, you can absolutely get into the industry as a self-taught programmer. It's still hard. Um, it might be even harder because I've had interviews where one of the things, first thing they asked me is, hey, you have a degree, right? And so I would have been probably immediately disqualified if I would have answered no. Um, um, but with that said, there's lots of games being made. And if you have like a solid portfolio, which to me, a portfolio is more important than a degree, um, I think people will be willing to bet on you. Um, so that um and then um i think making games in any en engine is hard i think unreal does unreal has become a lot more um user friendly since like uh when i worked with it in college um um but i think um and so i think the the best i don't even think there's a real answer to that i would say if you're curious about making stuff in unreal i would just download unreal download some free assets and see what it's like just to kind of throw stuff in the engine and see what happens right uh, yeah. well we haven't really got around to you brian uh, did, did you have any questions for jonathan oh no but i would plus one what jonathan said uh, hi jonathan i'm brian I, I worked in game development like a thousand years ago but uh <laughs> <clears throat> back when we didn't install anything to like the hard drive and you couldn't fix bugs after gold master, but like, so uh, like, so my, like I, I, I came to age as an, a software engineer when like the bar was just zero bugs, which is just night and day compared to what you're describing, which we all understand. But, um, but just to pile on what Jonathan said about breaking into the industry, some of the people that break in are just the ones that get really creative with the constraints they have, because like a lot of software developers have to do that maybe not as much these days as they did in the past but um i know a software developer who got hired because he sent uh, a dozen krispy kreme donuts like <laughs> to, the, to the to the to the dev team with his resume on the inside of the box like taped to the inside of the box and i and i know another game developer that got hired because he custom printed uh, a six pack uh, bottle beer bottle holder with all of his resume information on the outside of it and then delivered <laughs> this, their favorite beer to the dev team and so um you know you could argue those things don't have a lot to do with with being able to do the job but it does speak to you know can you take a, a set of constraints and come up with a really unique solution to a problem because that is actually really important as a skill to have as a, as a game developer 100 percent So yeah, like in, in the past, Brian, uh, I know, like you mentioned that you couldn't really ship with any bugs. Um, how was that exactly? Like, uh, how did how did you minimize the amount of bugs? Was it just like thorough QA testing or? Yeah, I mean, it was it was really like aiming lower, like where, you know, where Jonathan says, you know, you have this legal requirement to ship. There was just a lot less money back in games, especially the ones I worked in back in the day. And so you just aimed lower because you knew that all sorts of things could go sideways in the last two or three months in the summer when you were like working crunch mode to get things out for to get them into stores by October, because that's what mattered back in the day was getting into Walmart and Target um for the holiday season that's what mattered probably less so now but um but it was very uh same problem it was just the solution was different it was uh you know cut back by a third what you hope to accomplish mm -hmm. and then just just kill that kill that in quality and recognize someone's about when you say yes as the 
you know, as the, as the tech lead, they're going to go press like a hundred thousand CDs like tomorrow. And so that bugs on there, whether you want it to be or not. So the question is, can you live with that bug forever or, or is it going to eat you alive at night and not let you sleep? And if the answer is the latter, then you stay late and you fix the bug. That's just all it is. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I wish we would have had updates like, you know, that we could have shipped back in the day. It's not, it's not like I look back and say, wow, I wish it would have worked, worked, uh, uh, I would have looked forward to fixing a few bugs we had to let go, but um, they were pretty small in comparison, you know, running this, running this game on a Mac. And instead of the audio cutting out, it, it reduced by 50% volume. I'm like, well, I can live with that for shipping, quite frankly, for Goldmaster. I'm not going to hold up a ship date for that. So, yeah. But Jonathan, I don't know much about your background. Sorry, I came in late. Like, it sounds like you've been doing like a, is most of your work like uh, contract work? I, I scanned your your LinkedIn mm -hmm. profile, but I couldn't. It looks like it's you've done it for a lot of different companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and I um, I worked at a um, uh, so I started my career in mobile games, essentially, right? So I think my first games came out like on the first very first iPad, um, and so I worked at lots of mobile studios, um, and then about. Uh, Five years in, I kind of transitioned into um, uh, VR. The very first game I worked on was for the Google Cardboard, and then I uh, made some stuff for like the uh, the Magic Leap. Um, made some uh, stuff for the Oculus uh, Go, um, and then more recently, like stuff for the Oculus Quest. And right now, I work in more like games adjacent type tech stuff, um, and so. Um, so yeah, all like very game engine focused, but I think definitely that first five years were like games exclusively and mobile games exclusively. Cool. Mm -hmm. so what, what was the feeling like when uh, you released your first game and uh, you saw the reviews and how people were reacting to it? Man, I was, I don't even think I paid attention to how people reacted to it. I was just excited to have my name in the credits, right? <laughs> like that was, that was the goal. I think, you know, as a kid, that's, you see the names and it's like, oh, I thought this is my name in the, my name in there. And then um, to see it and be able to share it on Facebook with all my friends and family, I was ecstatic. Um, and it was actually turned out to be a pretty good game too. So I was really proud. Um, I still have screenshots of it on my portfolio. Like, yeah. So like, uh, where, where do you see you uh, yourself taking your career next? Uh, do you plan on staying in the same space or? Right, I think I really like making stuff. And so I think I think I kind of like, I've been working on my indie game. So I work on like the games adjacent tech and then I've been working on like indie games on the side. And I kind of like that because I think working on a game full time is a whole different thing than working on an indie game on the side. Um, and so, um, definitely. I, I just like, I, I just like to make stuff like I, and I've always been open to like whatever opportunities present themselves. That's kind of how I ended up at an animation studio. And, um, and so the truth is I, I always feel bad for saying, I don't know if I have a direction for my career. If, as long as I'm just continuing to make stuff, I'll be happy. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I think I'll keep on making indie games. I think, I, after making like Galactic Bar Fight, which has been a lot of work and it's been tough, but um, but I also I just think there is a, a, a mental space and kind of a sense of just satisfaction I get from making games that I have a hard time kind of letting go. And so even if I only made small games, I still want to make games. So how important is it to uh, like cultivate and maintain relationships in the industry? I mean, super, right? Like, I think I've gotten jobs because I've worked with somebody who worked with somebody, right? Or um, I've interviewed with people who remembered me, right? And they're like, you know, just sticking around sometimes is enough, right? Like, you've, oh, you've been doing this for a while. You know what you're doing. You've, um, you know, been able to, a, a big requirement on so many game development um, job postings is like having one or two published titles. And so, um, but like with that having that network of connections is so valuable right because if someone can vouch for you and you've released games and um, you're you're going to be some kind of asset right um, yeah
I had a question. Uh, Brian, did y'all have any uh, other questions? Kind of a gray area. Um, but how do you feel about like emulation and uh, not necessarily like for the for the act of piracy, but um, like for example, like the Nintendo Switch might not be like a very powerful console, but obviously there's like PC emulators that can upscale eight times, sixteen times resolution and all that, like, all that jazz. I, uh, as a game programmer um, or developer, uh, how do you feel about like the emulation scene? Or do you have a do you have an opinion? I mean, I've I mean, since I was a teen, I've enjoyed emulators, right? Like I think one of the first ones I there's like a browser emulator where you could play Pokemon Red in a browser. And I remember I couldn't afford a Game Boy, right? So that was that was how I played Pokemon Red for a long time. So um, I'm a big fan of emulators. I'm probably not supposed to say that, but here we are. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think and I think uh, emulation takes a lot of work. Like I, 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 I'm a big supporter of those scenes. I know, um, I get why, you know, Nintendo isn't exactly, you know, uh, waving flags in support of emulation or anything, but I also think, um, I, the thing I've heard people mention a lot lately is kind of game preservation. And um, even with my mobile games, like there's certain mobile games of mine that you can't play anymore because they were on the iOS store and the studio closed down. So you'll never play them again. And one of my games, um, it's called Thunder Jack's Log Runner. The only version of it that exists are like cracked APKs. And so I've downloaded a pirated version of the game I worked on just to uh, be able to play it myself. And so... Um, so yeah, I'm I'm I I don't have any issues with emulation, and I have a Steam Deck, so I downloaded an emulator on that. Uh, mostly of games I've already bought, but um, yeah, I I I don't have any issues with like uh, emulation. Yeah. Yeah, I'd I'd say the same thing. Like, I, it's almost like a. I don't know what it's like. It's like being able to rent a movie from the library after it's no longer in theaters, right? Like, I just kind of see it as this way to, just like what Jonathan said, like, mm -hmm. there are these games that were so instrumental to, because they had breakthrough technology or just because it's a memorable thing from my childhood that I want to play and I will pay probably way more than I should to play that game. Mm -hmm. I don't mind paying to, to buying an emulator just to play this one game that either I worked on or that I remembered playing when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Like I, 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 I have a special place in my heart for just bringing up a really difficult game for like the NES and making my son play it because he's just, <laughs> he thinks the games he plays now are hard. And then I'll bring up like Ninja Gaiden and like just laugh <laughs> while he cries and get so angry because it's so hard. And or Castlevania, you know, where you can't change your direction mid jump and you get hit by these little floating heads going like whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. But that just that's a memorable part of my childhood is just being so mad at something so unfair that like you threw your controller across the room, even though it was attached because there was no wireless back in the day. And then you would just like go on a walk, but you would come back and, you know, there's so many life lessons in like dealing with things that are unfair, um, like where gay people went out of their way to make things impossibly hard for you to accomplish. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I enjoy reliving those memories and I think emulation is a great way to do it. And honestly, if another company's not really going to support me being able to play that game and someone else is like, I just, I can't fault people for wanting to, to make that game more accessible to people who never got the chance to play it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a classic. Yeah. yeah totally agree. Mm -hmm. so, so, so do y'all feel like, uh, as games progress, like it, especially the triple a game that they sort of lost their soul especially as it becomes more about uh the economy of games let's put in gambling microtransactions etc right like i it's hard because i think having worked on some of that stuff like i think what well, we cared a lot right but it it's it sucks when you work on something and you make it and you want people to enjoy it and then your bosses are like but let's make sure it makes a lot of money too. And mm. so um, <laughs> let's like make sure that people will have to, you know, I, I'll say one of the games I worked on, uh, one of the early mobile games I worked on before 
you know, I think loot crates have gone through a lot of iterations even to get to this point. But um, we had like basically when you would, there are like virtual cards in the game and you spend real money to buy the virtual uh, car- current. I don't know if it was a virtual currency or you'd buy virtual card packs. And so there was a conversation where basically our bosses were like, our game designers like, hey, we should make sure when they buy the cards, they don't get cards they already have, right? Like, obviously. But then our bosses were like, but if they can buy, get cards they already have, then maybe they'll buy more cards. And um, that's tough, right? To like, you know, as a gamer, like I want you to be able to experience and have the full experience of the game and be able to play with all the characters and to try all the skills, right? But then our bosses are like, but that's a money-making opportunity and we can sell them these characters and then, like, you know, reduce how effective their money uh, is. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, I wouldn't, I don't want to say games have lost their souls because that feels, uh, that does feel a little disrespectful for the people who do spend the late nights, you know, envisioning these worlds and writing these long scripts for the characters' dialogue and, you know, with sit- rendering, spending hours rendering the characters. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, I think anybody who grew up playing the games that we did, you can see it's very clear, like, I feel like when I was younger and I bought a game, I knew the experience I was good getting. And even if the game wasn't the best game in the world, I don't think I ever felt like the game robbed me of an experience. I feel like modern games, sometimes it feels like, you know, I'll, I'll use NBA 2K. I'm a fan of the games, but I think I feel like there are certain ways they make it really challenging to even enjoy the game in order to encourage me to spend money. And it's like, oh, now you spend enough, you can have fun. And that sucks. Um. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Jonathan. Like, there's an example from a book, and I can't remember what it was, but The Hurt Locker, like a, a, a movie that won, you know, because we often compare movie and uh, like game and film industries. And so I think this is an appropriate one is, you know, you can have a goal to create a great game, and it's often at in conflict with making a profitable game. Like, and there are exceptions where you make both. But uh, but often it is because you create a great game that then a lot of people want to play that creates it profitable. If you start with the goal of creating a profitable game, it, it very rarely becomes a great game um, right. because you put things in there to make it hard to enjoy unless you've paid enough money. You know, and this exists in movies too. Like The Hurt Locker wins Best Picture, and I think its total gross box box office amount was like forty nine million, right? Mm-hmm. That's a very small amount of money for a movie that won Best Picture. I think it is still holds the record for the lowest grossing box office dollar amount for any movie that's ever won Best Picture. Now, wow. Alvin and the Chipmunks 2 <laughs> came out around the same time, the squeakquel. It made $443 million, <laughs> and it's like 10 times the volume. Now, no one can sit here and tell me that 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 Alvin and the Chipmunks too is ten times the movie that the Hurt Locker is, right? You, you can't. Um, but there are cases where you optimize for something other than profitability, and so. But it is a trade-off, you know. I've worked on games that people will still come up to me and talk to me about, like twenty years ago, that said, "I remember playing the game you worked on," and that. But that is not a. But those, that's because the, the uh, creative control was retained by the development team and that the publisher didn't get involved too deeply and profitability wasn't a top line thing. It was like, make a great game, make a great game that you want to show your kids and that you hope that they get to play at some point. But it is at the expense of profitability. It's very often, it's very rare that those two things are true at the same time. They just don't overlap that much. Yeah. So I know like uh, there's a limited budget when it comes to making games, it's not an infinite budget. So when it comes down to cutting content, cutting features to hit the deadline, what what is the decision making process that goes behind that? Uh, Oh, man, I guess I won't use the phrase because my because I think it can be kind of offensive. But um, (laughs) I think I mean, I guess the softer way to say it is getting rid of your babies is kind of the way my producer would explain it, right? And so um, 
so yeah like you can work on stuff for months right and then like you know you find out a month before it comes out if not in even a little bit later that like it's not going to make into the game and it, it, it hurts right like you spend all this time you know trying to fine tune it trying to make sure it works well trying to make sure it works in the larger scheme of the game and then you know you just get to that final round of like okay the game's ready to go out and it this feels off right like this isn't quite where it needs to be we're gonna just shut off this whole part of the game right i've had parts of the map like okay where they're not going to this area of the map and it might have been the area the team was most excited to have players explore um that part gets dropped uh characters get removed um you know you have like these long flowing narrative pieces to, like try to bring players into your world and it's like no, we're just going to show them like these three screens and then they're in. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it, um, yeah, I think at the end of kind of by the end of the game, like usually the goal is just to get it out the door. And so you can work on the game and expect it to be much bigger. And really I'd say that final month or two are really, that's where the chopping time comes. And, um, yeah, you, you kind of, everything's out on the table at that point. Right. Have, have you ever worked on a project that was canceled? And if so, like, how did you deal with that fact? Yeah, I've worked on one. I've only I'm, I've been really fortunate to only have one canceled game. But I also it it's upsetting because I think it would have been our most successful game. And um, it was with we, DreamWorks was publishing it. Um, um, it could have been a really great opportunity. And the reason the game fell through, actually, it wasn't even related to our team. I think the work we did was good, but DreamWorks and then the studio that was like publishing the license that we were building for the game had kind of a falling out. And so our game just kind of got lost because that relationship broke up. Um, and it, you know, I, it sounds dramatic, but I think there definitely is like a sense of mourning, right? Because like you imagine this game, you imagine people playing it, you imagine, um, you know, there was a, our game designer he even to prep for the game he would like there was like a two-week span where they were like hey we want you to basically write a game design document for this game and for two weeks he just kind of he would come into work but he'd spend all night watching um the show for this ip with his kids and then he wrote this really comprehensive game design document and i think the way he we like realized and made the characters relatable um, and in the property, like, it, I think it was just a really awesome game. And I was really excited for us to release it because um, there's a lot of love and attention put into it. And then, like, we're really invested in this thing. And then eventually it's like we come in one day and it's like, yeah, so close up the repo and um, put, can basically put the project away. Uh, we're going to move away from that and we're going to start to work on something new. Uh, and it, yeah, it it's it just feels kind of deflating, right? Like just like there's all this momentum and excitement and hope for the game, and then um, it just kind of falls apart. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'm, I think it's kind of just that the result of working in like entertainment stuff, right? And yeah, I I think if there's any saving grace, the good thing is like it it doesn't feel like it was our team's fault, right? It was it was just kind of circumstances and business stuff above us. Um, but it 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 still hurts to like make something good and know that no one's ever going to see it. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, there's so many technologies to choose between Unreal Engine, uh, Unity, etc. If somebody's wanting to get into this industry, how do they pick? Uh, you know, uh, a, a technology to make sure you know they'll be employed for the next you know few years. That's a good question. Um, and I would still say, I think if like, if you want to get a job in games, I think Unity and Unreal are your probably two best bets. Um, they're the most commonly used game engines. Um, and so, so yeah, I would say those are the two I would like gravitate towards because people are always hiring for Unity and Unreal jobs. Um, I think realistically, I would say, I would say start out with Unity because I feel like Unity projects are easy to easier to get into and um, I'm actually planning on picking up Unreal this year because um, Unreal un Unreal developers get paid a lot more than Unity developers mm -hmm. and um, but the also the ceiling like the skill 
the expectation for Unreal developers, I think, is a little bit higher. Like, I do think they tend to be a little bit more solid engineers, um, uh, which I'm sure I have friends who are, like, Unreal guys who hate Unity, and I'm sure they'll love me saying that. But I think it's... Um, but I, th I think that's the truth. So I would say, yeah, I'd say pick up Unity, um, make a few small game projects, and then, you know, build your portfolio. I, I definitely, I, I always go back to my headphones. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I always go back to like, um, I think the portfolio is like the most important thing anybody can invest their time or any energy into making. Um, I, I got my job because my portfolio was good. I think the degree was neat or whatever. But, um, you know, when I look at a lot of my friends who didn't get jobs out straight out of college, I think the difference between us was like, I was just making like lots of random small prototypes, right? Of like my Mario type game, or, um, you know, I'd showcase some of the stuff we made in class and they didn't put that much uh, work into like the presentation of their portfolio. And I think that that mattered a ton. Um, yeah. Uh, did any of you other guys have any uh, questions? I guess I have a question, Jonathan. Like, I've been out of gaming for a while, but like, <clears throat> how much, uh, what kind of constraints do you guys run into now? Is it more of a, uh, is it is it more hardware based or is it more time based or is it more, hmm. well, I guess I should ask this a different question. You know, there there is this triangle in, in gaming. It's like time cost quality, right? And so it's like, which one do you see like, you having to solve and optimize for in your experience? Is it mostly time or is it mostly cost or is it mostly quality or some combination of two? That's a great question, right? I, I think I think I tend to work on VR stuff right now. And I think quality kind of tends to be the 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 big dividing factor, right? I think um you know there's good enough to get it out the door and there's good enough to make sure it's something memorable. And I think there's just not a lot of studios that want to make something who not that they don't want to make something memorable but it's more important that you get it out on time than it is that it's really good right yeah memorable um, is like a p3 it's not a p1 <laughs> exactly 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 <laughs> i see gotcha mm -hmm. yeah it's it's funny i i look back to some of the people who were my mentors in gaming and they definitely dealt with a lot more physical like hardware constraints sure, they, feel, sure. they feel very much like uh like nasa level engineers in terms of optimization but merely for a creative space not really to land someone on a moon pass or fail yeah. but to right. to make things happen that were just i didn't think were possible in some of the constraints they had just mm -hmm. I remember a friend working on Sly Cooper, like for PS2 and having like four megs of addressable memory space to be able to run like a full 3D game real time on a TV. And you're like, and then I open up task manager and Gmail is taking like 400 megs of RAM on my computer. And I'm like, what are you doing? You're not doing anything. <laughs> right. like, how can you be using that much memory? Like that, like, I always have this, like, we're spoiled little children when I think about mm -hmm some of the constraints we deal with in uh, mm -hmm. in gaming compared to what we might run like on a local machine and mm -hmm. how the, the discipline is um the focus is just elsewhere right the focus is on right. cost and not necessarily on memory but yeah right yeah, yeah. i i think a, a, i think john carmack had a quote that he felt like working on games was harder than working on rockets which that you know that struck me yeah. <laughs> yeah. for sure i remember a system developer brad that i used to work with and he was working on just as a side project he was working on a, a, what he called tiny game which mm -hmm. was a game that was just meant to be like a simple race car that had to stay on a track mm -hmm. and um he wasn't done with it but when i last talked with him about it it was 69 bytes wow and it's just like he's overflowing <laughs> memory buffers in order to get a shift in the lines in order to create the curves and oh my gosh and it's just like that's wild it's just like <laughs> some of the creativity and mm -hmm. how deeply you have to understand how the hardware processes stuff. Right. Um, it is a very different, it's a whole nother language altogether to mm -hmm. understand. And it's impressive to see how much they can do with so little. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's pretty interesting to me about gaming is it seems to like have an effect on other aspects of society, like um, 
-hmm. you know, VR was in gaming a long time ago, and now mm -hmm. Meta and all these other companies are picking up. Uh, do you mm -hmm. see any trends in, in gaming now that you can foresee a society picking up down the line? I feel like, I mean, I feel like gamification is something that people talk about all the time, right? But I feel like the kind of, the act of just trying to make participating fun i feel like that's what like a lot of society has been working towards right um and so um i and i i can't really see that trend changing much in the future just because i think you know it's a lot easier to um go through like an interactive simulation or, or you know a more engaging experience than sitting through you know a video like one of the companies i uh, uh applied to a few years ago was like they basically have like a VR HR training simulation. So like the, you'd have a phone in your hand and like they present like a virtual video of a scenario and you'd basically click a response on the phone and like move through this kind of like scripted scene and you'd like see the reactions from people as like you either made a bad decision or a good decision. Um, but I think that's a lot more engaging than sitting through like, you know, an HR monologue or, you know, an HR video um, like, you know, you actually have some level of participation, you do feel present, like these people are around you and engaging you, you're seeing like a real situation. Um, and so yeah, I, I think, um, I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of aspects of games and kind of that interactive nature and kind of gamification of things that's going to continue to be uh, more common. Um, a friend of mine, he's actually working on, I guess, this thing called Fireberry. I, I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but it's like a, a mixed reality virtual human and um the whole point of it is like they have this ai and you have to fire this ai right like and so um and i guess it's supposed to teach managers how to fire people and i guess i wouldn't say that one's fun let me like step back like i don't think that's an enjoyable experience but i think it's a more um interesting and like memorable interactive way to kind of learn a skill um or adopt a skill um and so, yeah, I, I just think like that interactivity, I think that's really valuable. Um, and I, I could see it increasing in, you know, all sorts of things. I've, I've seen um, VR simulations that are uh, virtual grocery stores that are used to train prisoners who just um, got out of jail. And, you know, what does somebody who's been in jail for the past 15 years know about like going to self-serve uh you know, a cash register, right? Like, and so, you know, just VR simulations that walk people through those type of things. And so, um, yeah, so I think like, you know, the gamification and kind of the gradual making simulation of experiences, I, I definitely see that continuing to grow um, over the next few years. I have a question for Jonathan. What's your, what's sort of your, what's your most memorable indie game that you think very few people have played that everyone should try? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, um, I think, oh boy. Oh, that's so hard. Um, there's so many that are flying through my head right now. I think, I guess for now, uh, the first one that came to mind is it's called virtual virtual reality and it's on the Oculus Quest. And so, um, the whole, premise is basically you're in you're like in this matrix simulation you put on like your vr headset in the like with your headset on and it takes you each headset takes you to like a different world and so it's just it's a really funny game um and it's just really interesting like you know you you put on certain headsets and like you know you're in a land of talking donuts or something right and then you're in a you put on another headset and there's like a, a bread, a piece of bread that wants you to butter it, right? Or um, you put on another headset and you see this weird three-eyed monster coming towards you and it's going to kill you, right? Like, it's like just a lot of like weird mind uh, warpy stuff. And um, it's it's not a scary game for what it's worth, but it is, it's a, it's a game I think doesn't get enough attention. I think they just came out the second one and I, I'm really excited to play that. Um, but yeah, virtual, virtual realities. I, I loved it. Yeah. Awesome. Check it out. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'd like to get your opinion on this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, games are becoming increasingly more realistic and VR that adds even more immersion. Mm -hmm. Like 
do developers ever consider the uh, potential mental effects, especially like when people are playing horror games, war games, like could uh, maybe somebody get PTSD when they're playing like a the newest Call of Duty and when they're seeing limbs fly around and, you know. I think it's a good question, right? And I, I think, I think it's something people haven't been really vocal about. I think it's something that's really important that we are kind of cognitive, uh, cognizant of, right? Because I think, um, because I think that's very real, right? Like I, I, another example of, of um, one of my favorite VR videos is I think Achievement Hunters, like they played through uh, The Exorcist VR and the guy who was playing through it, he like worked through like two areas. He was terrified, but he was okay. But he had like a snake phobia. And of course the third level was a snake level, right? And like, he was like really struggling. He got through it and it was fun to watch. And like, it's, you know, you feel good for him after, but like he like had to take off the headset and take a break. Cause it was like really disturbing to him um, to be in this virtual situation with virtual snakes all around him. And, um, and, and I, I think it is important that we're kind of aware of, you know, especially with VR, VR, like it, it interacts with your brain in a really weird, really, uh, really real way, right? Like you can take off, people take off the headsets and sometimes you might feel, um, I think they call it depersonalization, right? But like, you might not feel right for a little bit after you put on the headset or, um, people talk about having your VR legs. Like I've put on VR headsets and gotten motion sick or, um, you know, like that scenario of him being scared. Like, I think, I think it's something that we really should think and talk more about, about how VR can actually affect and, um, affect people and their mental well being. I don't, I don't feel like there's been a lot of conversation about it. And, and I think that goes, it's like a bigger conversation. I've heard a lot of people talk about, about how, um, people in tech need to have more ethics classes. Like, and, and I, I totally agree with that. I think that it's um, um, important that we're not just making tech without being aware of the humans behind the tech. And, yeah. yeah, I never had a, I think the closest thing we had to 3D when I was in games was a really awful marketing decision by a Nintendo called Virtual Boy, which was like a, a goggles that you wore that had like this red light. And um, I, I don't think it ever got to the point where people were emotionally or mentally impacted by the game, but I knew some people who tested the game and there were some pretty strict rules about how long they were supposed to test. It was only supposed to be about 30 minutes at a time. And then you're supposed to take like a three hour break. Well, Jonathan, like, He's going to laugh, but it's like the QA team was told, like, you know, as they were trying to ship these games, like, oh, yeah, you can only test like 30 minutes every three hours. It's like, there's no tester on the planet who's going to keep their job <laughs> if they follow that rule, right? They're right. going to test, test like eight or nine hours straight and probably not take a break. And yeah. a lot of them uh, wouldn't have PTSD, but they would literally take it off and they would be seeing images um, like like four hours that they that were not there. Right, you know, and it was, uh, it, it certainly wasn't a, an emotional response, but it definitely was a physical response to uh, some of the some of the testers and what they have to go through to get like a console game approved to get it through uh, like Sony or through Xbox is uh, there's some Herculean level efforts of the amount of hours they put in to sort of make those things happen. Like they have to put fans on the console so they don't overheat because that they will work they will work until that machine overheats. So, and they'll have backup machines and they get to take 20 minute breaks for lunch and they're working 13 hour shifts and they work 90 days in a row with no days off. And so, um, yeah. the, the physical toll that a lot of this takes just on the creators, um, it is very difficult to go through. I mean, it is a labor of love. Nobody goes into game development to make a million dollars. They don't, they do it cause they love it. Um, yeah. and the hope is that we can find a way for to support the creativity side with them without taking advantage of their passion. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So I got uh, one final question. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about things like chat GPT and AI, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been looking at some of the ads that's generated by mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. It's, it's very impressive. And I've mm -hmm. also seen a guy, uh, he used chat GPT to make a game using Unreal Blueprint. So do you foresee a future where AI is uh, really utilized to 
uh, help in the creation of these games? I definitely think to help in the uh, creation of the games. I think um, I think I feel like I even when I was like a junior programmer just starting out, I feel like I've been told forever that the AI are going to replace the programmers any day now, and so so have it hasn't happened. And I've heard the programmers are older than me heard it like thirty years before I started. So I don't think I think our jobs are safe for the moment. But um, uh, but I definitely think it could be useful in helping to you know. Um, uh, helping the creation of games, right? So I've seen on uh, our, I'm on Reddit a lot. And so our game dev, um, people have used it to like help name areas, which I think that's one of the harder things. And I think that's super uh, useful to have um, a AI just come up with some potential names. And then you kind of take that and start to like figure out what the best names and kind of massage them. Um, I think um, I actually put a prompt into chat GPT for like, hey, can you kind of describe what a jungle game level would look like? And um, it did a really good job of like, you know, talking about vines on a temple and like, you know, the way it was, the scene was lit and, you know, a chest in the corner and like, you know, really doing a really good job of like speaking to what like this environment would look like. And, you know, the kind of prompt you probably could give a concept artist to kind of render out like a basic image of an environment. Um, I think, um, you know, coming up with character names or, you know, even if you gave it um, a style of clothing, like, or like if you ask it, like, what kind of, what kind of clothes evoke a certain era, era or like, um, I'm sure it could help you with that. And so I definitely think AI could be really helpful in making games. Um, I think uh, I, whenever people talk about it, like automating us out the job, I kind of go, mm, I don't think that's going to happen because I think games have been doing procedural stuff forever and i think my the kind of the biggest thing i've seen with procedural games is like i always say they start to feel samey because um you know an ai if you give it a bunch of parameters and say hey i want you to make a level with all these parameters it's going to make as many levels as it can within those parameters but eventually there's going to be a common thread and it's not going to know how to add any variance to that um and i think that's kind of where you need the human touch to kind of kind of come in and add variability um and so yeah but i think i think it'd be really awesome to like use it in game um, development i think it could be really helpful to kind of formulate the beginnings of ideas and you know let your team kind of take off from there yeah i mean uh, plus 100 to what jonathan said i think the only thing we're at risk of anytime soon of AI taking over is the parts of the job we don't want to do. <laughs> like, like it's yeah. like, hey, like optimizing some polygon count for whatever or mm -hmm. writing names. It's like mm -hmm. most game developers I know don't. Mm -hmm. They're like that naming that level and naming that naming <laughs> 85 characters. is just like, that's not mm -hmm. what I want to do. Like I have to do it. I will do it because I have to. But if I had an intern next to me and I could just say, dude, mm -hmm. go do, go figure this out. Mm -hmm. Anything I could hand off to an intern that doesn't require that much brain power, I would be yeah. happy to give off to chat GPT because of what Jonathan described earlier. It's a way to shorten the timeline or, or minimize the cost with that with and with minimal impact to the creative control that the, that the team would have right because any minute jonathan has spent naming levels is a minute he's not spending doing something that's higher value for for the for the success of the game so why not have some ai do that in parallel where he could just dump a bunch of stuff in here come back 15 minutes later and he gets a hundred names and half of them are crap. And so he gets rid of them, but he has 50 names for basically copying and pasting something into a browser. Mm -hmm. Like you can't argue that's not valuable. Yeah. I don't think that means Jonathan's at risk of losing his <laughs> job though, either. So, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, I know we're kind of getting over time. Um, did any, I have any closing thoughts? I just want to jump in here. We'll Rule can say that the big risk is only when it's when AI gets smart enough, when it can go from creating names to creating full levels, and then you know it comes up with the the models for characters, and then it, it creates its own like prototype for God of War one, and then it, it learns a combo system, and then it and then you you know it hires a, a writer to come up with a storyline, and then. <laughs> so i think well yeah i was just gonna say i think at that point then we'll all just be testers for the ai <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go and all get to qa 
Right. <laughs> yeah, what's that famous quote? There's a great quote about this. What is it? Um, the future of automation like is a man and a dog, right? And the man <laughs> is there to feed the dog and the yeah. dog is there to bite the man if he touches anything in the room whatsoever, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, man, we definitely appreciate you uh, coming on, Jonathan. We'll definitely have to have you back. Not for sure. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you all for having me. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch y'all next time.